name is Jan van Boekel. I'm a professor in art and sustainability at the Hansen University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. And I will talk about art and the sensorial imagination of the unseen. My theme will be about the importance of imagination in, as a way to engage more actively with the ecological crisis and to what is remaining unseen. I will start with a short excerpt of a film made on John Berger, who lived for some decades in a small village in France, in the mountains. And he talks about the importance of place to him. Uh, the point about center is, is, it, is it's where life naturally makes some sense. Home is the center of the world because it's like a cross. There's a vertical line and there's a horizontal line. And along those two lines come the following. I mean, the horizontal line is all the roads leading out from the village, from that center, across to other places, and finally to, to, to all over the world. Uh, it's the way you get to that home on the surface of the earth. And then there is the vertical line, and that is where... Uh, the dead um, and maybe the unborn go up and down between earth and heaven. Uh, and when they cross like that, that is a place which is really home because the dead and your ancestors are, are there in the cemetery. Uh, the children who are married and will have um, little children will perhaps still be there. And then there is all the traffic of the world. And when you live in a situation like that, uh, the question of answering uh, why are we here, the question of finding sense, is much easier to answer. But in how many places of the world is that now true? Uh, either large cities or villages, in fact, in very few. So what I take from this film is the importance of being in this connection with the vertical line, which is the line of time, you might say, the ancestors before us and the unborn generations to come. And the horizontal line, all the village, the, the, the roads and the pathways that go in the village and leave from it. And he says, if you're on this connection between uh, time and space, uh, when the two lines meet, and it is the, 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 the question of what is the sense, the meaning of life is maybe a bit less hard to answer. So a way to relate to a place, to landscape is if you draw a line on a piece of paper like this, a horizontal line, it immediately suggests the landscape. Above is the, the sky and below is the earth. It sort of divides the space in half. Here we have the sky. In artwork, in painting, if you move the sky upwards uh, or the hor horizon upwards, automatically the gaze is more turned towards the earth. You're sort of looking down towards the ground. It allows you to be more, to paint in a more abstract way, as I did in this painting. Here's another painting of uh, Jacques van Looy, where there's no horizon at all, no sky. So again, immediately the gaze, you look, you're looking at the earth itself, the details of the ground below you. And uh, it's an area that is sort of eclipsed, it's hidden from our ordinary uh, view. We are, there's a vast world growing underground, under our feet, but we're very little aware of it. It's only in the last decade that more and more science uh, and also popular culture is interested in the connections between root systems and fungi, and how they connect with each other, but usually, mostly, it is uh, beyond our grasp. In fact, this whole area of darkness uh, is something eerie, something uncanny. It has to do with the dead, their ancestors, burial grounds. It's often part also of fairy tales and of myths in our culture. I think, in a way, this is very strongly exemplified in this painting by John Gast, which is about manifest destiny, the destiny of the Western man, uh, Western culture, to bring the light of civilization, the enlightenment in a, a dark world, the world of wilderness where the native people live and the wild creatures are like the bear in this picture, 
And the woman, Colombia, she's bringing the school book in her arm and she has the star bringing reason uh, into an area where this is apparently lacking. And in her uh, wake follow the railway tracks and the tele telegraph lines. So it is the light coming into the darkness. It tilts the image uh, a bit. Then the darkness is below. You again, come to this division between the light uh, of day above and the darkness below. I would suggest that this is a scheme that is very much part of our psyche, the way we relate to the world, that the unknown is below us. There is the, 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 the dark and frightening uh, part of our life. And the, the, the daylight is reason and, and is the progress. I'll talk a bit about what I call mythopoetic narratives, the, the way in poetry and mythology, or the, the two combined, this plays a role in our culture. For example, in the painting by Theodor Kittelsen, it is the Nurken, it's, it's a, a creature that lives under the water. If you come too close, he might pull, pull you in. It, it's sort of an otherworldly being, um, uh, also related to the underground. So it'd be interesting that according to... Uh, Aristotle, animals were perfect if they resembled their parents at birth, and imperfect if they did not. Spontaneously generated animals were per definition regarded as imperfect and belonged to the lower species. This um, drawing by Jan Luyken is uh, of the Ark of Noé, and it's, uh, it's the lower compartment. And you see all the animals sort of on the ship uh, when the, the flood had come. And if you zoom in on this um, drawing more carefully, you see all the animals caged. But then uh, below, uh, zoom in on the detail, you see the snakes, the beetles, the, uh, the crawly creatures, um, the toads, that are the lowest compartment of all of the boat. In fact, they are amidst of all the shit and the, the urine of the other animals. And it was uh, believed that they would uh, were spontaneously uh, uh, were coming to life there in in this mud and in this uh, darkness. In, in as part of this mythopoetic world view, um, there's also this idea for, which has been around for centuries that the barnacle goose uh, did not uh, originate um, its offspring didn't originate from the goose itself, but that it would come from a shell, in fact, from the barnacle. Because the shape of the barnacle shell was so much had so much in common with the bird, because people did not understand at the time that the, the barnacle goose would go off to the Arctic to get to breed and then come back with young. So it, it was believed that it was spontaneously coming forth out of a shell. Similarly, um, people would not understand uh, uh, could not uh, understand the contrast between the colors of, for example, a poppy flower so vastly different from the greenness of the rest of the plant. So a popular idea was that it must have been a butterfly landing on top of the green uh, the greenness of the plant and then metamorphizing, changing into the red uh, flower. So, so that um, as one way to explain uh, why you have this enormous contrast between the flower and the rest of the plant. Uh, storytelling in fairy tales, for example, of Beatrix Potter or uh, Peter Rabbit, very famous in the Victorian times and still today. What is little known is that uh, the author, Beatrix Potter, was very vividly in contact with the living world. She had this uh, ma mouse as a pet for years, Sarifa was her name. But she did with her brother, she would uh, collect dead animals, for example, a fox, and then skin them herself or, and boil uh, the cadaver. To, to save the, the bones. So there was a very strong uh, interest, a fascination with the natural world, even in some ways maybe uncanny from our current understanding. Yatsi made these uh, maybe less known uh, fantastic drawings of the natural world, these mushrooms, for example, part of her fascination. You see the same fascination with the underground, also, for example, in this book by Jules Verne, uh, A Journey to the Center of the Earth, where you have these vast spaces under the Earth's skin, where there's oceans underneath us. There's even, uh, again, a, a mushroom forest growing there. 
So there's maybe an obvious connection if you make a story, if you come up with a story with uh, uh, acting out under the, the in, in the Earth's interior, that mushrooms play a role there. Which we also see in Alice in Wonderland, which was uh, maybe of interest, formerly called Alice's Adventures Underground. Here she's meeting the caterpillar sitting on the mushroom. And she also eats pieces of a mushroom to be able to grow or to shrink in size. So this sort of fa fantastic fairy tale like uh, way of relating to the world is in a way a big in a big contrast to what has been called the know-it-all state of mind. And to explain what I mean is that I lean on the story of D. H. Lawrence, the writer, novelist. He talks about the magic lantern, maybe pretty much like this um, device of the, the very common in the 19th century. People would that, would gather together and look at slides and be uh, yeah, impressed by it, but, uh, fascinated by what the stories that were told. So here he relates about a story. Uh, of, 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 uh, he tells a story of how we relate to other places uh, through storytelling at that time. He says, superficially, the world has become small and known. There is no mystery left. We've been there. We've seen it. We know all about it. We've done the globe, and the globe is done. It's quite true, superficially. On the superficies, horizontally, we've been everywhere and done everything. We know all about it. Yet, the more we know superficially, the less we penetrate vertically. It's all very well skimming across the surface of the ocean and saying you know all about the sea. There still remains the terrifying underdeeps of which we have utterly no experience. Poor creatures that we are, we crave for experience, yet we are like flies that crawl on the pure and transparent mucus paper in which the world, like a bonbon, is wrapped so carefully that we can never get at it, though we see it there all the time as we move about it, apparently in contact, yet actually as far removed as if it were the moon. So we're very much out of touch, I would say, he's trying to suggest here, out at the other side of the transparent mucus paper. Then he goes on, he says, the matter of fact, our great grandfathers who never went anywhere, in actuality had more experience of the world than we have, who have seen everything. When they listened to a lecture with Latin slides, they really held their breaths before the unknown, as they sat in the village schoolroom, we, bowling along in a rickshaw in Ceylon, say to ourselves, it's very much what you would expect. We really know it all. But we are mistaken. Know it all state of mind is just the result of being outside the mucus paper of wrapping of civilization. Underneath is everything we don't know and are afraid of knowing. He wrote this in 1928. When yeah, I think the big world travel, the globalization was very much still uh, not on its way yet. Still, we had already then this attitude, this know-it-all state of mind. That is a problem, maybe, if we relate to uh, yeah the growth underneath our foot, the, the whole fast living world that is there, that we tend to know it all. Reality as this graph is showing, this statistic is that British children know very little uh, still about uh, wildlife and plants uh, and other species, and probably the same as for other countries. So you see, for example, that about more than 80% of the children in the UK are unable to identify a bumblebee or uh, an oak leaf. Many are, of course, below, uh, are able to identify a fox. But very common species, I would say, are not part of their life world. They cannot really sort them out, identify them. This has been called the shifting baseline syndrome uh, or nature amnesia. That we've, the knowledge of nature, how nature is or has been, is, tends to be um, forgotten. That uh, each generation, to put it another way, uh, the way they relate to nature, that they tend to think that nature as it is, is as nature has always been. So the, the baseline of what has been changed in the course of time has changed without us really noticing. This is like a school place when I was young, teaching about the fast biodiversity in nature. But Horace Sewells, he says, the ecological crisis is really a crisis in perception. We are not truly seeing, hearing, tasting, or consequently feeling where we are. So what to do about it? Already in 1932, uh, 
we were entering, you might say, a, a, a space of hyper-reality, of making reality more real than it is, in fact. But for example, in film, speeding up processes of growth in a plant. So in order to regain uh, interest and fascination with the living world, these kind of devices uh, were, this kind of you know, ways of working were implemented as if the, the slow growing of nature is not fast enough. So we again get the fascination back by the speeded up version, which is still happening in films that are made now. This is a very recent film made in the Netherlands called Onder het Maaiveld. It tells that there are more living organisms in a, in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on Earth. And then the imagery is fascinating, zooming in uh, with much detail on growth processes that are happening underneath our feet in the soil. Speeded up um, in fast speed, uh, showing the natural world uh, as it is moving and crawling. regaining our attention as we try to work with the land, with the soil. How about the implicit connections? The, uh, the, not maybe bringing all, all, everything out into the opening, into the manifest um, clearness of uh, speeded up film. And here I uh, lean on Nora Bates and she says, I'm increasingly finding that the most vacant uh, realms of change, learning and evolution are beyond the organism's current capacity to perceive. The flexibility that lurks below conscious perception is like the soil beneath the forest, teeming with relational processes, while most attention is caught up in what can be perceived. There is a wildness in the implicit correlations, connections and coalescing impressions. This unseen realm is vital, non-trivial, and sacred, and it is real. So in, in this unseen world, there is a sort of realness, even if it is still on the level of implicit. Um, it's teeming with relational processes. Another way of approaching the natural world, besides speeding it up, for example, through film, or zooming in uh, ever more deeply with our microscopes, is to try to see the world with fresh eyes. For example, as practiced in this approach by Margaret Cahoon and Axel Ewald, of trying to develop new eyes for plants. And I'll talk a bit about this. They lean on what has been called the Goethean approach, an approach informed by Goethe. And it is, uh, has these four stages. It starts with exact sense perception, moves on to exact sensorial imagination, being and beholding, and lastly, being one with the object. I'll say a bit about each of these four phases. Exact sense perception, try to meet the natural phenomenon, like for example, a plant, a fern, it could be, as if you see it for the first time in your life. Henry David Thoreau, he said, you might try to make acquaintance with the fern, but to say hello to the fern, the, you should forget your botany and all the prior knowledge that you have about them and meet them for the first time. So with all your senses, your exact sense perception, you try to understand what this plant is about, what it smells like, what it feels like, maybe even tastes. So you, you allow your senses to really get a picture of what, of what this natural phenomenon is about. Then you move on to the next stage, which is exact sensorial imagination. This is important for my presentation here, because it is about how through imagination we kind of can fill the gaps in in a process because if you meet a plant uh, it is a moment in time but you don't see how the plant will be evolving uh, a few hours later or a day later so uh, what they work in, in the Goethean approach uh, often with is this uh, seeing uh, looking at leaf sequences like what would be the stages in between the different manifestations of the leaf you don't see them uh, but as a, pl a plant grows from the first uh, leaves, as they sprout from the earth to the full-grown gr plant, there's all these stages in between. And only through your imagination, you can try to see how the connections are built, uh, how the plant is growing. So you, the, uh, besides uh, uh, next to having it speeded up in film, you can try to use your imagination, your fantasy in a way, to, to get a fuller understanding of what the plant is about, what time is doing, what processes are doing, um, uh, 
when time is allowed to uh, to to evolve. And the third stage is again adding a picture, a, dip, a more deeper understanding of the phenomenon. It's called seeing and beholding. And here you allow the uh, the plant, for example, to express itself to you. So you become more receptive. You try to to to, to grasp what the essence of the plant is about as it is moving your way and. and Often this is then done in the form of poetry or art in this way to, to get uh, another way of knowing, complementing the, the sense is complementing the imagination. The last one is uh, being one with the object, which is where the intuition is st start to, uh, starting to um, play a role. And also thinking that you, you try to see all this, the previous dimensions, what they add to each other, and you get a fuller a holistic picture of the, the plant itself by bringing them together. And also the, the your intuition is allowed to, uh, to play a role. What Goethe said is every new object clearly seen opens up a new organ of perception inside of us. Our organs are as the flesh of the world emerging into consciousness of itself, like an infant examining the back of her own hand and gaining sudden insight that the limp is her own. So the, it's the way you might say that by our way of uh, getting to know the world, perceiving it, it's the world getting to know itself. Opening up a new organ of perception in, our, in, our, in us. Then uh, back to the underground again, the world below our feet. It is, uh, I think, very um, uh, interesting, but also important that several indigenous peoples, like, for example, the Hopi, in their creation stories, they tell about that they first were below the surface of the earth and they, by following a, a reed or a, a piece of bamboo, they creeped from the underworld into the upper world, the world of the light. And this is still manifest, for example, in the Hopi Kivas, these underground cha chambers that they have uh, where they live in the pueblos. And by going up and down these ladders, they, you might say, reenact, they relive the connection of having once moved from the underground into the upper world. This connection to uh, not only the soil, but also to other creatures is also found among other native peoples, like, for example, the traditional Koyukon in Alaska. They live in a world that watches in a forest of ice. A person moving through nature, however wild, remote, even desolate the place may be, is never truly alone says Richard Nelson, an anthropologist who spent much time with them. Surroundings are aware, sensed, personified. They feel they can be offended, and they must, at every moment, be treated with the proper respect. These are sounds of ice, as it is moving. Richard Nelson says, in the fall time, you'll hear the lakes make loud cracking noises after they freeze. It means they're asking for snow to cover them up, to protect them from the cold. So there's this dialogue going on, a phenomena in the natural world. Uh, you might call it a nice poetic uh, sensibility. You find something similar among the Sami peoples. On the zombie, one of the uh, uh, Sami activist and writer, scholar, he talks about yoiking the landscape and he says, a yoik a way of singing is not a song about the forest, about a mountain or about a tree, but in effect, by yoiking the tree, by yoiking the river, the, roi the, the river is alive, the, the, the mountain is alive. In a way, you might say that the mountain, the mountain needs the yoiking to, to be, there's this close reciprocity between humans and the, the more than human world. But you also find in this artwork that the relationship between the ancestors were there and the birch trees, called imaginary homecoming, is the images of earlier Sami people on the trees. And there are these sacred places all over uh, where uh, ceremonies are being done, uh, where uh, offerings are made. The recent film Historia about uh, Sami artist Brita Marakat Laba, it tells about this underground people. She says, 
When it became quiet, you started to hear and see things. They called this the underground ones. When they talked of the night reality, this refers to the underground world, which is so fascinating to me. That's what is beneath me. So there's this appreciation, or maybe also even understanding of that there is a whole universe below us. You have to treat with proper respect. Also in Western culture, for example, in this painting of Nikolai Astrup, uh, called Warmen Komate Iwerden, it shows this woman who is bringing ashes, calls from the fire to the spring, uh, to the river in the springtime. And she's going to put the heat into the water so that spring may come back again, so that the, the heat of the earth, the warmth of the earth can come back again and fertilize the the the, the, the plants may start growing again. Johannes Sveinsson Kjerval was an artist in Iceland, painting often outside. You see him standing with a big canvas. And he made these wonderful paintings, often of rock formations. And again, you see how high the horizon is. He said it as a small boy, he was tied on the back of a horse. and uh, The family traversed uh, Iceland. And he was tied on the back of a horse. He was all the time looking down at the earth. Therefore, much of his paint is art with this gaze towards the ground, towards the earth. Lava formations. And he says, lava formations have such a life, the personality and form of expression. You can become frightened and suddenly have the feeling that someone has been standing and watching you for a long time. This is how feeling and intuition have unconsciously begun working in tandem. So again, this idea that you have been, that the, the, the surroundings... The modern human world is also acknowledging you, seeing you, paying attention to you. Zoom now a bit, but bit in on this the relation between the ground and the horizon. And I talk about uh, David Abram and his book, The Spell of the Sensuous. Uh, it's a very interesting and rich book to, uh, on the subject. And he starts by talking about time and how Aristotle, uh, he comes back again, he also said, talked about. Uh, the lower creatures uh, who spontaneously generated uh, and the uh, higher creatures. But here he talks about time as an infinite sequence of now points. Now, 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 every time now moves, is, is uttered, it becomes uh, already past. Chronological time uh, chopped up in pieces. And then he says, every time, um, sorry, three, uh, he, I mean, he, uh, he's in a wilderness area, or in a wild area. Uh, it tends to vibrate with life and sensation. In this open present, I am unable to isolate space from time. I am immersed in the world. So space and time come together in such a space. And uh, the Abram writes, Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty both strive to articulate a more immediate modality of awareness, a dimension whose characteristics are neither strictly spatial nor temporal, but are rather both at once. Such a mode of experience is a commonplace for indigenous oral peoples for whom time and space has never been sundered. So time and space were not taken apart by indigenous peoples. And Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty tried to regain some of that deep connection of immersion as in this artwork uh, by uh, Carleen Hewitt and Rita Ikonen, or this artwork by Timo Fatjainen, the kind of immersion, immersion, the surrender to Earth. So, visible horizon, Ibram says, is a kind of threshold that joins the presence of the surrounding terrain to that which is hidden beyond the horizon. It carries the promise of something more and other. Past and future are as hidden powers that approach us, offer the present, while remaining themselves withdrawn and concealed from the very present that they make possible. There's also another unseen region, and that is the whole inside of my body, hidden from visibility in a manner very different from that which lies beyond the horizon. Similarly, there's a fast mode of invisibility that is part of the present landscape, the absence of what is under the grounds. So basically there are two absences, the, the, uh, what is beyond the horizon, what we cannot see, and what is absent is what is inside of our body, uh, what is below our skin, and what is below our feet. And then here he dwells on Heidegger, who says the future, that which is to come, withholds its presence, while the past, that which has been, refuses its presence. It, it, it is 
refusing um, to, uh, to open itself up. It is supporting us, but at the same time, it is again uh, withdrawn from our perception. That which has been and that which is to come are not elsewhere, Abram says. They are rather the very depth of this living place, the hidden depth of its distances and the concealed depth on which we stand. When our awareness of time is joined with our awareness of space, space itself is transformed. Space reveals itself as this vast and richly textured field in which we are bodily immersed, this vibrant expanse structured by both a ground and a horizon. As long as we structure our lives according to assumed parameters of a static space and a rectilinear time, we will be able to ignore or overlook our thorough dependence on the earth around us. Only when space and time are reconciled into a single unified field of phenomena, does the encompassing earth become evident once again in all its power and its depth as the very ground and the horizon of all our knowing. So what David Abram tries to do, leaning on uh, Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, is to, 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 to get to, to, to understand past and time as one in, in one moment where they are not separable anymore, that it becomes this immersion uh, and that the ground and the horizon, which are uh, keep something absent in the present, are actually the very basis of uh, integrating this, this uh, experience of space and time at the, at, the, at the present moment. How then, how do we then regain this direct experience and awareness of no distinction between space and time? We find our way into the sensorial presence, and I would say maybe art can be very important here of regaining that, that, that sense of connection that so is a present among indigenous oral peoples. Uh, the cross that uh, John uh, Berger made in the beginning of the early film, is you find it back again in the poem of William Blake, where he says, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So in that very moment uh, where you're uh, holding that wild flower, you have the infinity of space and the eternity of time meeting each other. And was round like a tortilla. Ashley Marmon Silco is a Native American writer from Laguna Pueblo. She says, my interest in time comes from my childhood with the old time people who had radically different views of the universe and reality. For the old time people, time was not a series of ticks of a clock, one following the other. For them, time was round like a tortilla. Time at specific moments and specific locations, so that the beloved ancestors who had passed on were not annihilated by death, but only relocated to the place called the Cliff House. At Cliff House, people continued as they had always been, although only spirits and not living humans can travel freely over this tortilla of time. Moments, um, what, I can't really read it. No moment is lost or destroyed. There are no future times or past times. There's always all the times which differ slightly as the locations of the tortilla differ slightly. The past and the future are the same because they exist only in the present of our imaginations. Without clocks or cal calendars, we see only the succession of the days, some longer, some shorter, some hotter, some colder, but the succession is cyclic. Without calendars or clocks, the process of aging becomes a process of changing. The infant changes, the flower changes, the changes continue relentlessly. Nothing is lost, lost, left behind or destroyed. It is only changed. This is, uh, you might say, from a Native American understanding of the, on the tortilla that the times uh, are present at once, the, uh, at different places of the tortilla. Another way of appreciating it, it, this is uh, sensibility comes from D.H. Lawrence, where he talks about the man who loved islands. And he, he says, this is the danger of becoming an islander. When in the city you wear your white spats and dodge the traffic with the fear of death down your spine, you're quite safe from the terrors of infinite time. The moment is your little islet in time. It is the spatial universe that careers around you. 
Once you isolate yourself on a little island in the sea of space, and the moment begins to heave and expand in great circles, the solid earth is gone, and your slippery, naked, dark soul finds herself out in the timeless world. And the souls crowd the footways that we, in the moment, call bygone years. The souls of all the dead are alive again and pulsating actively around you. You're out in the other infin infinity. What is, I think, happening here is that you have the line of the uh, the, the horizon or the, the, the line dividing sky and earth. If time uh, is allowed to expand, uh, that you're entering what he calls the infinite time, for example, when you move to an island and you're not in the traffic of the city, uh, the immediate the immediacy of the, the second, the, the chronos time, then in a way that the land, the voices of the land, the souls from before can start to speak and enter through the openings in time and play a role. And um, here I think is where the imagination comes in. For example, in this uh, the drawing where the, the pansies, the, the flowers acquire human faces, or where you walk in the forest and suddenly you find a, a trunk or a piece of uh, tree that resembles maybe a bird. Children playing with uh, uh, branches which become reindeer antlers. The imagination allows you to, to work uh, in another way with the, this crossing of time and space that the moment itself expands. For example, in the workshop with clay that I do where we work with the metamorphosis of organic forms. How do natural forms change in the course of time. The one participant makes a, a form, maybe a mushroom or an acorn, and the other person tries to see how that form might develop in time, adding to it uh, a new form that is a, a change, suggesting a change in time, how the mushroom might look a month later or a week later. And you get these sequences and then you have to find uh, links, linking one sequence of forms to another link. But you can only do this by engaging your imagination, being fully present in the activity. You get these strange forms of one form metamorphizing to the next, and you pay attention to what somebody else is, has been making, and somebody else is paying attention to what you have been making, taking it further all the time, connecting links, of making links, and making the missing links between one sequence and the other. And afterwards, you can have a reflective moment talking about all these wonderful sculptures that came about and what it tells about ways of creation, about the importance of imagination, for example, in, in dealing with uh, a theme like sustainability or the ecological crisis. So here we do the same workshop, but then outside. And <laughs> David Rottenberg, the philosopher and uh, composer, playing on his uh, clarinet. You see that one form is slowly moving towards another shape. And to me, this is like uh, the Islamist is telling about that the, the time is expanding, that the voices of the land, the soil below us, can come to the surface in a quite other way. Rather than speeding up the process of nature, zooming in deeper and deeper until we see the most minute details. I think I would say in another direction, bringing to bear the imagination at where the vertical line and the horizontal line that John Berger talked about meet each other. This is my uh, presentation um, on engaging the imagination in relationships to um, working with the unseen, the world below our feet. Thank you so much, Jan, for that wonderful presentation, for helping us to see the unseen and to reach toward understanding of unseen 
I think we take time for a couple of questions. Maybe we have a little bit longer, a smaller, smaller lunch break then. <laughs> we go over a little bit. But yeah, are there any questions? I can start. <laughs> uh, you showed that uh, part where kids don't understand, recognize bumblebees. What is, what is the context behind that? Uh, why? Um. Why I, I added to the, the, the chart uh, saying that the children have little knowledge about um, uh, the, the names of species, like for example the, the bumblebee, that they cannot identify these? Yes. Yeah, the, so the, the reason for putting it, it was uh, in the context of this, uh, at, one, at one hand that we, in our culture, we have this know-it-all state of mind, this viewpoint of D.H. Lawrence that we, 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 we tend to know everything because we think it's all, all readily available, whereas in effect maybe this, um, uh, what, what is actually happening is that we seem to know it all, but the actually knowing, being able to identify through for example, knowing the names of common species is fastly lagging behind that. So there's the contrast between maybe our, uh, in the Western world, our arrogance about that we are in control of things, where in reality we are out of touch. We, uh, even the most common uh, species that children don't uh, are not able to, to see that these, uh, even those words are the, disappearing from our dictionaries because they are no long, the names of certain species are no longer relevant in our life world. I find that a very frightening um, development. And um, so I, I put in that slide as a sort of indication. It relates to also what uh, Avelina was talking about, the shifting baseline syndrome, the, of, that each new generation has an impoverished uh, knowledge or understanding of nature or ecosystems. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I ask that because uh, I see that um, maybe kids are not uh, being with nature enough uh, and uh, I have heard this program forest immersion uh, that uh, you go to the forest and kids uh, recognize what is uh, there and uh, there's questions so what you see and but uh, I, I just wanted to understand the context of this knowledge because why those kids don't uh, know bumblebees that I, for me, it was like a problematic thing. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you for that. Any other thoughts, ideas? Yes, please, in front here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm curious, um, I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, the dark side of the imagination. Uh, when the imagination starts to feel like colonial desires. Um, I think we all know like within the Western colonization, uh, all the sugar land and the abandons behind the horizon or with Ukraine, like Ukraine as a bread basket that will feed the whole world. Um, so I'm just, I love your thinking line with like how we need the imagination, but I'm also curious like the disaster it can bring along and how we we inhabit it. Like as Estonians, we maybe not anymore, but we still believe like the forest will always surround us or, you know, because it's feeding our imaginations. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good point. Uh, and um, so the, my uh, suggestion would not be to, to, to solely base one's actions or one's approaches only on uh, the imagination. I think also the, in that, that uh, it would be good to keep the, also the, the rational part, uh, the, the way of uh, making, trying to make sense of developments or understandings through um, logic uh, as a complement to the imagination. Indeed, I think with, with imagination, there's always, you might say, this dark side also present. I showed some uh, uh, images of also the eerie part of the darkness. And um, I, I would say in Jungian terms, the, the, the shadow, that uh, the, the other side of, say, the, the, the more enchanting aspects of imagination, that the, the shadow aspect of 
the, the dark or the, the violent side is also very real. And maybe uh, one thing art can uh, be of help in this way is that, say, for example, if people have nightmares uh, about the climate uh, situation or about Ukraine, that art can be a way to bring these uh, the dark feelings or the, the, these nightmares out to the surface uh, and by bringing them out into the surface to express them, for example, in a painting or a drawing or a story. And by sharing that with, with each other, uh, that, that these, um, uh, these thoughts, these fears can be made available for conversation so that through conversation you can maybe as a group try to address them but the, the, the fears are there, the, the, the dark side of imagination is with us, uh, whether we maybe like it or not. But the, I think the key is to, to find ground, common ground uh, for conversation to, to engage with it, and maybe also to, to, to find ways to also use it in a productive sense or in, in a meaningful sense to move uh, forward. So, but I take your point that it is, uh, I, I emphasize maybe more the creative uh, and enchanting aspects of imagination, not didn't zoom in too much yet on the, the, the dark um, side of it. So good, thank you for your question. Thank you. I would so much love to continue that discussion with you. I'm sorry that you're not here, so we cannot discuss the, those topics further during lunch break. But really, thank you for that speech. We will think about those ideas further. And yeah, let's give you a last applause.